Welcome back to Showing Our Sass, the podcast. I am your host, Marta Gwynn, and today I am joined by Mickey Dean, who is going to talk to us about quite a lot of colorful things. Uh, And by colorful, I mean we're going to sit down and we're going to talk about a whole lot of black folk stuff. So... Mickey happens to be my cousin and he's had quite a lot of interesting world traveler adventures uh, going all over the continent of Africa and he's going to sit down and talk to us a little bit about his career, how he has worked for Black Power, and we're going to have quite a lot to learn from him today. So sit back, enjoy as we really dig down into this elder conversation and see what he has to share with us on this week's episode of Showing Our Sass, the podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself to the people who are going to watch and listen to this? Who are you? Okay. Uh, well, my name is Mickey Dean, and uh, I, I happen to be your cousin. There it is. <laughs> Yeah, uh, to, to be uh, technical, uh, first cousin once removed. And uh, I, uh, I'm i living in Kansas City, Missouri now. I'm originally from Sandersville, Georgia, who anybody that knows me will tell you that I always say it's the hometown of the Army Lodge Muhammad. And uh, I never, ever intended to end up in Kansas City, but uh, I started school at Emory University in Atlanta. And after a couple of years, I transferred out to the University of Kansas in Lawrence, which is right down the street. My goal was to finish there and go back down south. But Kansas City, as far as I got. And uh, so here I am. And uh, I've been here uh, since then. And uh, uh, I'll I'll say that during my college days, uh, instead of going to school, I was uh, involved in the uh, Black Power Movement. You know, we would enroll and, and get a little scholarship money, and then we'd be all over the country, you know. So uh, I didn't graduate when I was supposed to, but but that's fine because those years uh, traveling the country, chasing Black Power, those were some of the, the best years of my life, um, and I would trade that for anything. But at some point, I knew I had to settle down and uh, move here to Kansas City, got married, and uh, finished school at the University of Missouri, Kansas City, and then went to law school. And uh, so most of my, my professional career has been in the legal profession. I, I did a little bit of private practice, but mostly it was with uh, city government. Uh, I, um, I enforced the city's, uh, I was the civil rights, the civil, I, I enforced the city's civil rights laws. And basically we were the municipal version of HUD and EEOC. We did employment discrimination, we did housing discrimination. We handle uh, the Minority Business Enterprise Program, um, uh, prevailing wage. So those were the things that that I spent my career doing. And uh, of course, I've been retired now for a little over seven years, but uh, I I truly enjoyed my career. I was doing something that I really liked. And uh, so it it all worked out for me. I love it. And I, I really want to hear more about these college years. So why don't I ask you about that? What What would you like to share with us about that uh, wonderful time in your life as you described it? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I grew up in the South. Uh, as far as as far as movement activities, I, I was sort of on the, the late 60s, sort of the tail end of the civil rights movement, which did come to my hometown. Uh, you know, we had our share of uh, marches, et cetera. Uh, at that time in the South, the movement was dominated by uh, Dr. King and SCLC. And uh, I, I, there were a lot of other things going on in the country at that time beyond the, the whole nonviolent civil rights movement, but I was just not aware of it until I got to college at Emory in uh, 1969. And of course, um, at that time, there were, there were two major movements that were really burgeoning. One was the anti-war movement against the war in Vietnam, and the other one was the Black Power Movement. And uh, so, um, you know, there were some sisters and brothers on campus that that uh, decided that, that I was a little bit of a, a country bumpkin, and they wanted to show me the ways of uh, uh, the the, uh, the city. And, uh, uh, and in addition to going to school, uh, you know, that's when I really, really first got involved in, in political activity. And uh, I would say the, the, the biggest influence was there was a chapter of the uh, Black Panther Party in Atlanta. 
And uh, we used to go, I never joined the Black Panther Party, but we used to go over there. They had political education classes. And uh, that was really my baptism into what, what we call revolutionary nationalism. And uh, I was always an avid reader, but they just introduced me to, to, to so much stuff. Uh, some of the other students on campus, um, the, the Black Panther Party office was over on what was then uh, Hunter Street, it's, it's King Drive now, which is right in the heart of the, uh, the Atlanta University complex. I had I had high school classmates that went to Morris Brown uh, and to Clark, and uh, uh, and so it, it was just an, it was just an exciting time, honestly, in this country to be alive, to be a young black person. Uh, the, 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 the you know the, the, the liberation movement was in the air. Um, and it was just something that, that you had to be a part of. Something that's, that, that's uh, I see a bit of a renaissance now over the last few years, but, but there was a, a period where, you know, it was really dead as far as uh, the, the, the rebellious youth. But, but I, I, I'm really happy at a lot of the things that I'm seeing now. But those were, those were my, my college years. And, and I ended up transferring, coming out to the University of Kansas. Um, and uh, there was a lot of similar activity there. Uh, I joined a national organization called the Student Organization for Black Unity, and uh, uh, and that was my opportunity to 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 I always use the term traveling the country chasing black power. But you know there were there were conferences, meetings all over the country, and uh, I, I had a chance to participate in a lot of that. I met a lot of people during during those movement days who have become who are still friends of mine. Of course, a lot of my ancestors now. Uh, but again, uh, it, that was that was really the, the, the formative years of, uh, of of my life, and it, it, it sort of established the foundation for you know where I am today, uh, my political outlook today. Uh, I've been, you know, you know, you 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 grow, you learn, you change. But I would say, as far as black liberation politics, I've been pretty consistent over the years. Uh, and and uh, there's there's been evolution, of course, but you know, that's where I am today politically. You know, so that's that's kind of where I, where I came from. But but those were some exciting times to be alive, and and uh, I absolutely appreciate the opportunity to have have to have the opportunity to participate in that movement. This is fascinating to me. I've actually never had anyone describe to me. Uh, the feeling and atmosphere of Atlanta in 1969 or 1970. Uh, when I visited with my mom about that time, uh, she, she your, my mom, your cousin, your first cousin, she uh, she mentioned to me that she'd had enough of the South. And that was part of why she left and went to Ohio when she made her college decision. Um, she wanted to see something else. And so she could not give me perspectives of, of what was going on in Georgia um, really during that time because she wasn't around what was going on. She was seeing uh, the movement as it was occurring across the Midwest as opposed to the South. So th that that is kind of eye popping for me, for you to tell me about some of the meetings and, and how the Black Panther Party was functioning in Atlanta. I will admit to you, I didn't realize the Black Panther Party was active in Atlanta during yeah. the 60s. Well, well and, and keep in mind that I came from a small town, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so to me, Atlanta, was was just the most fascinating place in the world, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, you know, when I when I go to, to Atlanta now, almost everybody that I encounter there are, are not from Atlanta, you mm -hmm. know. What I mean? You know, but at that time, you know, it, it, most of Atlanta were, were, were native people. It, it had that southern feel to it, and and uh, I just enjoyed being there because it it, it offered so much, particularly, um, you know, in terms in terms of. Uh, a, a radical movement, you know. Atlanta, Atlanta was, as you know, it was the center of the civil rights movement. Uh, that was one of Dr. King's strongholds, but it did become uh, sort of a bastion of the revolutionary nationalist movement. And you know, Black Panther Party had chapters all over the country, mm -hmm. and uh, they had an established chapter there in Atlanta. And we got to know the sisters and brothers there, and we we spent a lot of time over there. That is amazing. Um, I want to follow up and ask. What is um, one of the biggest learning opportunities you feel that you experienced in your life? It can be life or career, whichever way you want to go with it. Well, I, I would say, and I'm going to say both um, in, in the movement aspect of my life and, and as well as in my career, I would say 
I have learned so much from the people that I have been privileged to, to be associated with. Uh, uh, during the movement days, uh, traveling the country, I was remember I was a youngster, you know, I was I was 19, 20, 21 years old, and I had an opportunity to, to really meet uh, people who were veterans of the movement. And, and at that time, uh, I, I mean, they were they were always willing to sit down and, and talk to you about what they knew, what they understood, what their experiences had been, uh, and and uh, that that was just an education in and of itself. In addition to, uh, you know, we, we read a lot. Uh, you, you know, at that time, uh, if you got into a discussion with a brother and sister, the first question was, well, have you read, you know, and, and you better have read that book, you know, that was, that was, that was kind of the thing, you know, we used to have these, what we used to call polemics, you know, these, these, these verbal battles, but it was, it was all uh, uh, a learning, a learning experience. And, and I got to, I didn't, you know, I, I can't say I was friends, but I got to 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 be in the presence of, of, of a lot of people like Kwame Ture, who was Stokely Carmichael at the time, and uh, Leroy Jones, who became Imamu Baraka, and so many of the other uh, movement veterans. You know, you had you had the opportunity to be in sessions with them, and to be in conferences with them, and and it was it was fascinating on the one hand, but it was a, it was a, it was truly a learning experience on the other hand. Career wise, um, and and I didn't really talk about what my career was, but. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an attorney by profession. I only practiced law for a little while. Most of my career, as I think I said, was in city government mm -hmm. and, uh, and in civil rights enforcement. And uh, our, our agency was, was an agency, a city agency that was born out of the civil unrest in the, in the uh, late 1960s. And, and if, you, if you go to most cities now, most major cities, they'll have a, a city department called Human Relations. Uh, human rights commission uh which is different than than human resources which is personnel but these these were, were were the concessions that were made to cities after the rebellions okay uh we need to we need to set up some type of a human relations race relations or some city department to really handle the, the, the racial issues that are taking place in our city so there there are a, a, a number of similar agencies around the country we also have relationships with hud Department of Housing and Urban Development and EEOC, Equal Opportunity Employment Commission. And uh, so, so we became sort of a, a family of, of um, civil rights enforcement officers. And we would have, uh, you know, one or two meetings a year, annual conferences. And, and, and so uh, I, I uh, had a lot of uh, interaction with my colleagues around the country who were doing similar work. So that was another learning experience. So in addition to you know, having to having to keep up with the law because law is law is fluid I and mean, it changes, and so you have to keep up with 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 uh, you know, the, especially the developments in the courts. But but uh, I could always pick up the phone and, and call a colleague in Chicago, in San Francisco, and say, "Look, we're having this issue here. Uh, have you experienced something like this? You know, let's let's talk about it." And uh, so so a lot of my learning experience was on the one hand, you, you know, like I said, I read a lot, so there was a lot of book learning, but there was just uh, uh, a, a lot of um, uh, uh, practical experience uh, that I had, and, and I just tried to take advantage of every opportunity uh, and to learn from just every single person. You know, if I talk to you for any length of time, I'm, I'm going to come away with something, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, so I just, I find people interesting, and, and uh, uh, I, you know, I try not to, to usually, want, if I'm in a conversation with somebody, I'm usually probably the person that's, that's doing the most listening. You know, because I, I just find people's experiences uh, fascinating, and, and I just I just get so much from other people. You know? I've always appreciated the way that you push me not to settle um, for an easy answer. Not that I always go for an easy answer, because I certainly don't. But um, I've appreciated how you've pushed me to um, reconsider positions in the conversations we've had in the past. So if I've never said that to you, I want to say that right now. Um, also. Uh, what's something you wish you had known um, that you didn't know when you first started your career path? Well, you know, uh, even when I first went to college, I had this notion in my head that, that I wanted to be a lawyer. And uh, my, my concept of a lawyer was, um, you know, Perry Mason, because that's, you know, that's what I see. Uh -huh. uh, there were no black attorneys uh, where I grew up in my hometown. And I didn't meet uh, my first black attorney until until I was until I was in college, 
And and uh, because of my involvement in the movement, I, I saw I saw my potential legal career headed in that direction. What I did know was that uh, uh, in the field of law, it is so vast. I mean, there there's just so many. I mean, there's not much you can do in society where there, there's not some legal issue or some legal question uh, uh, that that you're going to encounter. Just like right now. Um, I'm just so interested in in some of the the legal battles that that, that I think are going to take place uh, with this um, uh, uh, this, this COVID situation in, in terms of whether or not uh, a, a company can force an employee to 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 uh, take these shots. You know, there's just going to be a lot of legal issues, and I, I just find that that kind of thing exciting. But you know, law law. I mean, in addition to what a lot of people are familiar with the, the criminal law because that's that's what you see on on tv uh but you know there's corporate law there's education law there's this law that deals with with the elderly there's real estate law family law entertainment law tax law uh broadcast journalism is another one because because when you look at cnn and those those stations they always will find a legal expert you know to interpret this or interpret that you know environmental law uh, you could have a career in dispute resolution. I mean, I just I was just not aware of of all of the vast areas uh, that you could pursue in a in a legal career. So had I known that, uh, I, I may have chosen uh, a, a, another type of practice. Or or and the other thing about having a law degree is that there are just so many non non attorney uh, careers you can have that where where your law degree is not essential, but it is extremely helpful. And a lot of times people in, in certain areas look for uh, lawyers. For, for example, uh, in my position as a, as a civil rights enforcement person, uh, I did not practice law, but most of the people that I encountered in my position around the country were attorneys, you know, their, their background, their legal backgrounds. So uh, uh, I, I just did not know the expanse uh, of a potential legal career. That, if, if there was one thing that I wish I had known going into this, uh, but, you know, beat it as it may, it worked out well for me. So. Very good. Well, from that perspective, uh, what advice would you give someone who was considering a legal profession nowadays? Well, uh, uh, in, in general, um, I would say explore all of the different uh, possibilities um, and all of the different opportunities uh, uh, to 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 um, uh, either practice law or, or have some involvement in the legal profession. The other thing is that I, I would say that that you know the most fulfilling thing for me was 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 having a job that I was passionate about that that I could really use my my skills right. So 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 you know find something that you're passionate about. If you really want to be a lawyer. Um, you know, the, the, when I was in school, the, the, the joke was, um, you know, what kind of lawyer you want to be? And the answer was, well, who's hiring? You know, and, and, you know, where do you get a job? You know, that, that's what you were going to do. You know, uh, I was fortunate enough to to clerk at a, at a civil rights law firm. And so uh, it, and it was just just so happened to be that that was really the, the, the line of work that I, that I wanted to do. But but my advice would be, uh, you, you know, you have to have a passion for what you're doing. If you really want to get involved in civil rights enforcement nowadays uh, in, in this environment, you, you really have to be passionate about it. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you look at some of the, the laws that are being passed by a lot of these state legislatures, I mean, they, they are, uh, uh, as far as civil rights go, they're just awful. You know? Oh, I'm in Arkansas. Believe yeah. me, I, I, it hurts. <laughs> I was uh, I was talking to one of my old colleagues uh, in, in, who uh, who's in another city, in Missouri. We retired about the same time, and uh, you know while we were working, you know here in Missouri, uh, the legislative body was mostly Republican, but we had a Democratic governor, and uh, and and the governor was able to 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 veto the the, the body was not veto proof, so he was able to veto a lot of the legislation uh, after we retired. Then we got a Republican governor. So now you've got a Republican governor, you've got a Republican uh, state legislative body, and they just began to turn back the clock on civil rights enforcement. And we were just thankful we didn't have to deal with that, you know. Yeah. Uh, so so if, if you're getting into any type of profession that, that is really trying to advance the cause of the oppressed people, you, you've got to have a passion for it. And you've got to be creative because because. Uh, there's just some draconian stuff that's taking place, and, and it's, it's it's really 
it's really not good at all. And, and it just makes this kind of work really, really, really tough. It makes me question a lot of things too. Uh, I'll, I'll admit fully, um, particularly with what's been going on the last couple of years, uh, from where I sit in my little state of 3 million people, I'm asking the question, is this where I want to be sometimes when I see what the majority rule is saying is important to them? So I, 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 I weep for the loss of folks like you who were in place uh, to battle those things from the, from the um, active employment kind of way. Uh, but I also understand that a lot of us who are in my demographic have got to decide, are we going to stand here and fight it? Or are we going to go somewhere else and live life more abundantly without that kind of stressor? So it's, it's a very real conversation I'm having with a lot of colleagues right now. Um, just throwing that little bit in. What are you reading right now uh, that's inspiring you? Well, I'll tell you a, a, a book that is just one, one of my current activities. I, I belong to a, an organization I'll call the National Black United Front. Uh, it was an organization that was it was found uh, founded in 1980. Um, it was it was uh, it, and basically what, what happened was that the, the, the black power movement um, w w was really uh I don't want to say destroyed, but but uh, it was really repressed. I mean, you, you had the COINTEL Pro, where they they, they really uh, tried to destroy the Black Panther Party. Uh, a lot of the uh, 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 black organizations were were, were forced underground. Uh, a lot of people just just gave up and went <laughs> went to corporate America. But by the by the late seventies, there, there was really uh, not much of a black power movement. And so the idea of the National Black United Front was to try to gather those remnants of the uh, of, of the black power movement and bring them together. And that's when we formed the National Black United Front. We started our chapter here in uh, uh, Kansas City in 1981. So we're, we're into our 40th year. Uh, and I say all that to say that, that, that one of my roles now, and I'm an elder now, we have, we have long, young leadership, but I've been doing a lot of work uh, on this reparations issue. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, we, we've got a, a, a local coalition here in Kansas City that, that's working on reparations. And so uh, one of the books that was really inspiring to me, and I, I don't know if you can see it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold it up. Uh, this is a book that's called My Face is Black is True. And it's about uh, Kelly House. Kelly House. Kelly House uh, was, was, a, was a person who... Uh, in, in the late 90s, late 1890s and early early uh, 20th century, felt that that black people deserve uh, pensions for all of the free labor that they had given uh, mm -hmm. while they were enslaved. Uh, at that time, the 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 former um, uh, soldiers that, that had fought in the war were, were, were getting pensions, and Cali House felt that. Uh, that, that 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 black people deserve pensions as a form of reparations. In other words, uh, uh, to, to pay us for the work we did, you know, all that time. And of course, that's still the essence of the reparations movement. But she was really one of the early pioneers in in the reparations movement and uh, in the movement that the organization that she had developed. And uh, her story is fascinating because because she she fought against all odds. Um, um, and she was hounded by the government. And in fact, she ended up spending uh, some time in prison. You know, it was a situation where they were they were collecting money and she was charged with fraud. And it, and it was all it was all a setup. But she was actually in prison here in Missouri, in Jeff City, which is a couple of hours from here. Okay. Uh, but her story is fascinating. Her story is inspiring because because, you know, we, we're in a tough reparations battle now, you know, on, on the federal level, trying to get HR 40. Mm -hmm. uh pass and which is the, the reparations legislation that's in congress and then of course a lot of localities such as ours we, we have local reparations movements going on but 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 the odds that she faced and and uh, her story uh her perseverance it, it's just really really inspiring and um uh, if you want to read a good book uh about a tenacious black woman uh, uh, who really fought hard for what she believed in against, I mean, tremendous odds. Uh, I, would, I would recommend this book, uh, My Face is Black is True. It's by Mary Frances Berry, and, and it's just really a good book. Oh, I'm, I'm definitely going to grab that one. That that sounds like something I should have been read. No. Um, that's exciting. Let me ask you uh, now, what is the best resource that you have found that's helped you along the way? 
to this point in life? I, I think, you know, from a, from a professional standpoint, it's, it's pretty much what I mentioned. Uh, and, and that is the, the, the people that I was associated with. Uh, people are a wonderful resource, <laughs> you know, because because uh, I mean, I don't I don't care who you encounter. There, there's an area of knowledge that everybody knows, whether whether it's from, you know, formal schooling or experience. But there's just something to learn from everybody. And, and of course, like I said earlier, uh, I leaned on my, my, my colleagues a lot um, um, in, in, in my career. And, and I found them to be a wonderful, wonderful source. Of course, uh, as I mentioned, um, just about any area of law is, is very fluid. Uh, you have to you have to stay on top of uh, uh, court cases because case law really uh, uh, determine a lot of, of, of how we enforce civil rights laws, as well as the uh, statutory laws. So so you have to uh, 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 do your research, do your reading, and stay on top of the law. So that that's always a, res uh, a resource. And there were a lot of um, publications that that always updated us on the law, as well as the conferences we attended. But I would say my, my main resource, in addition to just my own um, uh, individual research and study and reading, what were, were my colleagues, uh, because experience is uh, uh, it, it's just a it's just a, a wonderful teacher. I, I, I'll just tell you this real quick. I remember um, you, you remember when, well, you may not remember, you're young, but um, uh, and her name is Casey now, but but the, uh, the the sister that had the issue with Clarence Thomas, um, Anita yeah, Baker. Anita Baker. Mm -hmm. Not Anita Baker. <laughs> Anita Not Baker. Baker. Anita Anita Hill. Ooh. Anita Hill. Hey! Yeah. See, I got uh, I got a little more years than you give me but, credit for. But but uh but 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 that whole incident happened as, as uh you know in, in, in my career, and what happened was that prior to that, uh, this whole notion of sexual harassment in the law was really unknown. Uh, it was there, but but uh, you know a, a lot of women were not aware of it, and, uh, uh, and 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 a lot of women just felt like they had to whatever happened in the workplace, uh, they just had to deal with it because you know if, if you went a traditional male job, the men would say, well look, you know you want to be here with men, well this is what you have to do. With. Mm -hmm. But but my my point with all of that is that what happened after that with it, it, it sort of uh, spawned a whole. Um, uh, uh, I don't know, sort of, sort of a a, a, a a business of sexual harassment training, you know. Yeah. And so you had all of these little shops pop up uh, uh, doing sexual harassment training, and I could always tell uh, when someone was doing a training who would actually enforce sexual harassment laws versus someone who had been trained to train. Okay, mm -hmm. because because they could follow a script on sexual harassment. But but you could always tell when it came to time for question and answer, because now they're off script, and uh, uh, and, and, and you, you see them stumbling around questions because if you didn't ask them what they studied, they don't know. But a practitioner, uh, as a practitioner, you have that experience. You you dealt with almost any kind of situation. You know, you know so, how to synthesize. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I I did I did numerous trainings in, in my career on, on really all aspects of, of civil rights law, and and uh, and one thing that you can rely on. Is is your experience and what you what you what you've learned? So I think that that uh, you know experience. You know that old expression: experience is the best teacher. Well, I was the best in that, but it's certainly a, a great teacher. You know. Mm -hmm. So. And then you brought experience with, along with um, being a voracious reader, also, uh, and then with the training of the law. I mean, it, it, it's just fantastic. I I will always be thankful for the brief amount of time that I went to law school because it it broke open how to attack case law, um, how to how to interpret statutory law. That was not something I got in my previous education. Uh, and then working for a state government in Arkansas, I had to learn how they put together bills and legislation so you can read through. I mean, there's a whole lot of muckety muck um, in how they put that stuff together. But it, it, once you translate it, you know how to function in that world. And not everybody gets that kind of education. So mm -hmm. I, I, I feel you on that one. Um, I am so excited to get to this one. I would like to know what is a common myth about black nationalism that you would like to debunk? <laughs> uh, a, a common myth about, about black nationalism and black nationalists. Well, there, there are several of them. As far as uh, black nationalism, I think I think there's a myth that, that it is anti-white, you mm -hmm. know. 
uh, you know, when, when you start talking about, you know, black power, black nationalism, revolutionary nationalism, uh, there, there, there's an assumption that you're anti-white. And, and, and that's so, so far from the truth. I mean, I mean, uh, we are, we are pro-black, uh, in our outlook. Uh, what we don't like, uh, we don't like racism. We don't like racist, but, uh, I, I can think of so many struggles, uh, o- over the years where we've, we've had allies, uh, with, with white people and white organizations. Now we, we think that, um, and, and this is one of the things that distinguishes our wing of the movement, black nationalism from the civil rights wing, uh, is that we believe, we do believe in exclusive black organizations. Uh, we, we think we believe in self-determination for black people and that we can, you know, we can work with other people, but, but, uh, our organizations, most of the organizations in the, in our side of the movement are exclusively black organizations, uh, which is different than the civil rights movement because they kind of pride themselves on, 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 on being integrationists. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so, so I think, I think that it is it, that, that whole myth that we're anti-white is, is one. Uh, there's also some myths about people who are involved in, in those movements. One is that, uh, you know, we, we don't, we don't like to have fun, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, that's not true for you. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, you know, like I said, my organization, uh, we, you, you know, we, we do a lot of cultural activities. I mean, we do Kwanzaa every year and, and cultural activities, but we also have parties, you know, where we just, you know, we, 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 you know, we, we, we play James Brown and, 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 and LTD, you know, so, so, you know, we just, Normal, normal, normal type people, but you know we're serious about uh, the work that we do. You know, mm-hmm. so, so, um, so, yeah, those are a couple of the myths that, that about about um, about our outside of the movement, and and uh, I, I think that that right now with with the you know this, I mean, you know, I grew up like I said in the rural South, but but this country now is about as polarized as, as I've seen you know in, in a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, as far as as far as as far as races go, but but um, you know we're we're not we're not anti-white, but but I will say that there are a lot of white folks that don't appreciate us, and there are a lot of white folks that we don't appreciate. So yeah, yeah. it in a way like I I was not living during formal Jim Crow, um, but I will say from the stories I have heard from those who lived through it and the things that I have read. Um, it almost feels like socially we've almost moved back into a Jim Crow kind of mentality and the way that we try to deal with each other um, in some ways. And I don't know what that's going to mean uh, for the for the good of the nation at some point. And I, I've i been on the side of uh, we need to be integrationists and I've been increasingly on the side of maybe we need to spend some more time with folks who uh, share our values. Uh, just because of the emotional toll it can take on you when you're walking into spaces where you know you're not welcome, um, so it's it's an it's an interesting time. Yeah, well, it's an interesting time, uh, uh, and and you know I, I listen to some of the uh, the, the people, um, in, in I mean on the, there are a lot of people in the Republican Party, but it's not just Republicans, but but they remind me so much of the type of rhetoric that that I used to hear from white people. And white politicians when I was growing up in rural Georgia. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, you, you know, there was a, there was a period where uh, it just wasn't fashionable to be overtly racist. You know, the country went through that that period. You know, but that's over now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, and I think maybe Trump had a lot had a lot to do with that. But but the the, the stuff that I hear, you know, uh, uh, from from legislatures in, at the national level and at the state level. Uh, it, I mean, it's still veiled a little bit. I mean, it's not exactly how it used to. They used to come at us in in the sixties, but but it, it's it's. I mean, it's it's just basically out in the open now. You know, uh, they're they're. I mean, they're white nationalists in my opinion, and and they're not. They 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 have no 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 uh, gumption about being being upfront about it, and and then you have these. Uh, uh, I mean, all of the stuff that's. Uh, on social media now, I mean, they they've just really found a way to, to, to spread their their message. But um, you know, we we're we're in a, you know, I mean, we we've got to, um, I mean, because there ain't no convincing these people. Of, no. Of, uh, so so we've just got to uh, create a sense of unity uh, among ourselves. What we've done in Kansas City is that you know you know once upon a time, uh, those of us in the Black Nationalist movement 
you know, we didn't want to deal with NAACP and, and Urban League and those organizations because we just felt philosophically, uh, you, you know, we, we were just different. But now, I mean, we're finding, okay, what, what do we have in common? We know that we have still have some philosophical differences, but, but what is it that we have in common? Because right now, you know, we need each other. You know, mm-hmm. and, and uh, because there's just there's just too much against us right now. I mean, you know, it's just the police stuff, the, the voter suppression. I mean, it's just so much stuff that's, that's coming against us now. And and uh, I think that, that there's just certain things that as black people, uh, you know, we, we just got to unite around and, 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 and you know, and, and deal with the fact that we do have differences. Right. But but that there, we have more in common right now. And that that gives me hope because I love seeing black organizations collaborating rather than competing with each other. I mean, we, we will have fundamental disagreements on some phil- philosophies, but uh, when it comes down to it, we black. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just a fact, we're black. And we and, and no one's going to be for us like we can be for each other. I'm, I'm convinced of that mm-hmm. um, very firmly. Mm-hmm. Um, I would like to know, you mentioned how in college you uh, traveled all around the place, but I also know you have left this country. Tell me a little bit about your travels outside of the U.S. and how it influenced your worldview. Well, um, uh, I, I've always had an interest um, um, in, in, in African continent. You know, you know, when we when we first started reading a lot of the revolutionary material, a lot of a lot of the people that we read were people like Kwame Nkrumah and Seiko Ture. Uh, Amika Cabral, and these were these were uh, African revolutionaries, and and uh, so that that really got me interested, um, you know, in, in the continent of Africa. Because honestly, I learned absolutely nothing about Africa uh, in school, other than what I saw on Tarzan, you know, and and that was that was really my my, my notion of, of of Africa, and uh, but the more I learned about Africa, the more fascinating I found it to be, and uh, uh, and I and I just wanted to go there. And uh, <laughs> oddly enough, my, my first um, opportunity to go to Africa was, was not where I really wanted to go, but it was to Libya. And uh, this was during the, the, the time of Gaddafi. And it was also during the time where there was a, uh, 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 now I can say this now because I think the statute of limitations was run, but there was a travel ban uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, to Libya at that time by executive order of, of uh, President, President Reagan. Uh, but you know there were there were ways uh, around it, and, uh, and and that was my my, my first experience there. Um, the the, uh, the the second country that I visited was was uh, there's a uh, Asa Hilliard was a, a brilliant uh, what we call chemitologist. You know, white folks call themselves Egyptologists, but chemit is the the uh, the term the, the terminology that black people use for Egypt. Mm-hmm. Chemit is what it was called. I think it's called that that word means the land of the blacks. But um, I had a chance to, to uh, my wife and I had a chance to go on a on a study tour with him to 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 uh, ancient Egypt. It's just fascinating, man. I, I learned uh, uh, so much, and uh, and then so subsequent to that, every opportunity that that I've had, uh, you know, I, I think I've had about eight trips to Africa now, and and uh, each each one of them have, have they've been unique. Uh, I, I've I've just learned so much. I'm in I'm in love with the with the continent. Um, Honestly, if I were thirty years younger, I would I would seriously consider, if not moving there, at least at least having a a, a place there, you know, where I could where I could just go uh, on on a regular basis. Because what you're finding now is that more and more uh, black folks in this country are are are, are relocating uh, to the African continent. I mean, when you when I when I was in I was in Ghana two years ago. And there's a huge African American population in Ghana. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, uh, Ghana is, is 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 sort of ideal because on the one hand, it's it's only about a seven or eight hour plane ride. Well, maybe maybe a little longer. And uh, uh, and it, it was it was colonized by the British, so it's an English speaking country, and uh, and it's just pretty easy to, to to navigate. But in in every African country that I've been in, uh, it, it's just been a tremendous experience. I was I was scheduled to go. To uh, Rwanda and Uganda in October, but obviously that got canceled, and um, uh, so I'm just I'm just looking back to and, and I was excited about those two countries because those are two countries that I had not visited before, so I'm looking forward to you know when things break loose to 
to get back over to the African continent. It just gives you, you know, getting out of the United States gives you just such a different perspective of, of, of the world, you know, and, and talking to other people from other countries and, and, and especially talking to them about how they view the United States mm-hmm. and what role, what role the United, United States government, uh, in particular, this military plays in, in, in their lives. So I encourage anybody, uh, if you have a chance to travel abroad, uh, you know, take that opportunity. And particularly for our people, uh, if you have the opportunity, go visit, go visit the motherland, you know, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and just, you know, because there's still so many myths about Africa. You know, one, one of the things that people ask me, well, you know, what about the crime? Oh. I'm like, well, you want to talk about crime? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're a nation of criminals. Where do you live? <laughs> well, <laughs> Uh, and, 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 uh, uh, you know, so, so, I mean, you, you know, you just have all of these myths about Africa, uh, you, you know, that the, the whole continent is just underdeveloped, you know, which is just not true at all. Rwanda has high speed rail. We don't have high speed rail. And, and, uh, uh, and then, and then the latest thing is, well, you know, aren't you afraid to, to, uh, uh because of COVID? I'm like, man, I'm afraid of COVID in this country. You know, uh, I mean, this this is about one of the worst countries. You know, in, in, in terms of, in terms of the spread of COVID, and and a lot of the African countries really are doing a lot better. You know, uh, uh, for one, they they've had a lot of experience, like with Ebola and some of those other things. Mm-hmm. Um, they they don't have some of the advanced uh, you, you know medical systems that that are in this country, uh, and there are reasons for that that we ain't got time to go into, but. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, I, I just I just think that that uh, y- y- you know, and, and one of the good things too is that there there are a lot of things now that you can find on YouTube where you have uh, expatriates, people from this country who who just talk about you know w- what they've experienced, that the people who live there, mm-hmm. and that's always good. But th- there's just still a lot of a lot of misc about Africa. Where you want to go on vacation? We're going to Paris. You know, we we mm-hmm. well, about Africa, Africa. You know, so there's still a lot of that among our people. Um, and, and, and a lot of it is, um, you know, what, what we see in, in the media, you know, as if every every child has got a distended belly and is hungry, that, that every place there's war, you know, and it's just it's just absolutely not the case. I've, I've had wonderful experience on the African continent and, and can't wait to get back there. I'm looking forward to going. I was on uh, track to go to South Africa for the first time because I have some friends who are there. Um, and then COVID happened because I, I finally went to Europe and that was mainly motivated because my brother's over there. Mm-hmm. I had really intended to go to um, uh, go to the African continent first. But um, I do have one regret from undergrad at Tuvalu. I had a chance um, to go exchange to Namibia mm-hmm. um, as a part of one of our exchange programs. And I would already scheduled to go to New York. Uh, for one semester. So I went to New York and came back and I seriously contemplated going to Namibia. uh, But they told me there's no way we're going to let you graduate on time, even though I had all of the stuff in in place that I'm going to tell some business about HBCUs. Um, I had everything I had. I think I hold the record in most number of credit hours in college, having completed in four years on time at Tougaloo. Mm -hmm. Uh, But they said you are required to be in residence at Tougaloo for the full uh, I think it's, I think you have to be there two semesters before you commence. And if I had gone to Namibia, they would have made me stay longer and I would have had to come up with the money for the extra time because I was on a full ride. And so I didn't go. And it is, a, it is a huge regret that I have because I just, I wanted to go. I wanted to see the continent. Um, that said, I'm, I'm going to go because yeah. I'm grown now. <laughs> I can go do what I want to do. Now, can I can I get off subject a little bit and tell you my my two glue experience? I don't know if I've told you this before. Uh, there was there, there's uh, uh, an, an organization uh, called the uh, well it was um, the uh, well it is the New African People's Organization, mm-hmm. and they used to have what they call Black Black Nation Day. Uh, um, I don't think they had it every year, but but every so often. And one year, this was back in. I don't know. It might have been in the late seventies, early eighties, when, whenever. But they had Black Nation Day in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, mm-hmm. and and uh, it took place um, over the weekend at at, at Jackson State and at Tougaloo. Uh, Tougaloo is in Jackson, right? It was Tougaloo. Uh, well, yeah, it's just outside the city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, 
the uh, uh, they had a cultural event at Tougaloo, and uh, and and uh, we uh, we we took some young people with us. You know, we used to have this mentor program called Simba Wachang, which is young lion in the Kiswahili language, and Falami, which is I don't respect me. That was the, that was the girls' program. We took them down. And they were they were gonna have a cultural program that night and there was gonna be some rappers, right? So I'm like, man, I ain't really interested in this. But somebody had to to, to chaperone the young people. So I went. And uh and one of the performers was this young guy that came out with, with, with his entourage. I'd never heard of him before, but it turns out it was Tupac. Okay. Uh so You were there when Tupac was on campus in the 70s? I, mean, I don't know whether it was the seventies. This, this was probably, no, no. This was, this had to be it had to be later, early nineties, I think. Yeah, yeah, that had to be nineties. That that would have been just before I. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but what happened was uh, there was an attorney, uh, Chokwe Lamumba, who eventually became the mayor uh, down there. But but he he was a uh, kind of a revolutionary attorney, and uh, one of his clients was uh, uh, Tupac's mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so so he was in Jackson. The New African People's Organization was there. And because of his relationship with Tupac's mother, he was able to 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 uh, to bring bring him uh, uh, to to, to, uh, to the conference. And uh, yeah, this this had to have been the early to mid nineties, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was. That's and, right. And uh, uh, but anyway, I got to see Tupac. I had no idea who he was, <laughs> but uh, but that that's that's who was on the bill. So that's my two little story. Well, Papa Lumumba, I know him because I went to school with Rukia, his daughter. Uh, okay. And his son Anton Chokwe is now the mayor of uh, Jackson as well. Yeah, he just won re-election, I believe. Mm -hmm. And his wife actually teaches on the faculty of Tougaloo. So, yeah, uh, yeah, the Lumumba family is a precious one to us uh, at Tougaloo for sure. And, uh, and uh, you know, you know when you know when, when Sandra, my wife, and I, when, when we were working. Uh, you know, we always said, you know, when we retire, let, let's go back down south. Let's go back down south. So we were we were set to start discussing going back down south. But when we retired, I, I think, you know, we didn't have any excuse then, so we was kind of scared to talk about it. But one of the places that, that I considered was Jackson, Mississippi, and it was mainly because of uh, Chokwe, because I had gotten to know him uh, over the years. You know, I, I met him in movement stuff. He comes to a lot of our conventions. Uh, we were both members of the um, uh, the the, uh, the 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 uh, radical black lawyers group, mm -hmm. and uh, and whenever he you know we would invite him to come here to Kansas City, he'd always stay stay with us. And so I really wanted to go down um, and 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 uh, you know live, live in live in Jackson. It was in the South. It's a town that's what about ninety percent black or something like that. Yeah, you know, right. uh, it, and and uh, but anyway, uh, you know, Chokwe of course unfortunately passed away, and yeah. uh, we're still here in Kansas City, so. Yeah, well, the South isn't going anywhere. If <laughs> you decide you do want to do it, um, I'm, I'm sitting here wondering how long I'm gonna sit in the South still. But uh, that's another story for another day, I suppose. Um, I I do want to say that though my first trip over the ocean was to Europe, my I first um, entered into the EU in Barcelona, so Spain was my first introduction. Uh, to full international status. I mean, I'm not counting uh, Bahamas and, and the Caribbean islands because that's still kind of close uh, here for me. And it was something else because I went from Spain to Italy and then over to France and, um, and then made my way back to Spain. And it was, it was when we were with Will in Italy that uh, when I went back the second time with my husband, that we were walking around. It was late at night. We were just taking a little break. We had taken on uh, the kids uh, to give their parents a little bit of a break. And we were like, why do we feel like we feel right now? And we realized there are no eyes on us. Nobody's bothering us. We're not paranoid. Um, people just letting us be people. And we asked ourselves, honestly, do we ever feel that way here in the US? And, and we had to say, no, we always feel like we got to be on guard. So I really am motivated to travel even more broadly because it's a shame that in the nation that I was born into, there's not a place that I travel where I am completely with my guard down as, as a black American. <laughs> well, you, I mean, you, you, you can't be and it. And, and like I said, it's, uh, uh, it's just not a, it's just not a, uh, this country is not in a good place right now. No, basically. it's getting worse. 
it is actually getting worse because it is a feeling of unsafe. My mm -hmm. brother doesn't want to come back. <laughs> he's, he's made it clear to the family. He does not want to bring his children back to this country. <laughs> I mean, not in the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, we're coming to a close on this one, but I want to give you an opportunity to do something that for some reason it's, it's, it's freaked people out a little bit, but I have a section called Spill the Tea. And what that means is you have two choices. You can either, since you know me, you can tell folks something about me that you think they need to know that they don't know, or you can ask me a question and I have to answer it. Oh, I can ask, I can ask you a question? Mm -hmm. and, and whatever you ask me, I got to answer it fully and honestly. Hmm. Uh, you know, you know, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't think about that one, but, um, um, I, I guess one of the questions that, that I'll ask is that you, you had an experience that I didn't have, and that was of uh, going to an HBCU. And uh, this this is not any kind of gotcha kind of question. This is just something that I'm, I'm interested in, in getting your opinion on. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, that that's a debate that's that's still taking place now about one uh, whether HBCUs are still necessary, and uh, two, uh, you, you know. If you were a young person that had an opportunity to choose, would you choose an HBCU as opposed to a uh, predominantly white institution? So, what, what about that? I mean, are they still necessary? You know, I mean, once upon a time, we know how they started, right? But they wouldn't let us in the other university. But now a lot of people say, well, you can go anywhere you want. And uh, so, why do we need them? And, and in fact, there, there's, I know in some states, there's been efforts to try to just consolidate them into the, especially if it's a state school. You know, mm -hmm. consolidate them into the regular universal system. So, what, what, what's your take on that? I'm happy to speak to this one, um, and I'm going to stand firmly in my personal experience on this one for why I say yes, they are still necessary, and for ways that people don't understand. Um, you know, I was born in Savannah, Georgia. You know, I was primarily raised in Iowa City, Iowa, in my formative years. Uh, Won a whole lot of black folks around. And then we moved to Northwest Arkansas, which is not the whole of Arkansas, which still, it wasn't a whole lot of black people around. And when I hit 16 years old, I lost a big fight with my father that I should graduate early so I could get the hell away from Northwest Arkansas. And I was willing to go to a small private white college in the middle of a dry county if I thought, that was gonna help me get away from what I was dealing with because my path had taken me in a way where I had so much confusion about where I belonged. I knew I belonged in my family. I, that, that was not ever a question. The, the family was a serious thing, but out, apart from the family, I was too black to be white and I was too white to be black and I didn't understand how to deal with the, the experiences I had worked through. And then I went to Xavier for a summer program that Derek Riveras was running called Super Scholar Excel. And I realized I needed to go to an HBCU because I needed a space where one, I didn't feel like I was an affirmative action placement, <laughs> uh, that I was, I was an acceptable black to be in a room because I knew how to talk. So I didn't offend people. I knew etiquette and things like that. I needed to be someplace where I could figure out who the heck did I want to be, you know, marrying the different experiences that I had had. And I was convinced it was going to be at Xavier. And I would have been at Xavier, except for we have a fundamental philosophical difference. They thought I should pay for half of my education and I thought I should pay for none of it. And so um, I, you could have told me I wasn't going to New Orleans until they were like, no, you, you got a partial scholarship, but you got to, your parents got to come up with the rest. And I was like, mm, no. And so Tuglu offered me a full ride and I said, I'm going to Tuglu. And I will never regret that experience. Um, it was tough. It was tough because I pushed them in ways that they were not prepared for me to push them because I had spent so much time around white colleges and universities. I understood the things that you could do in ways that most kids who came to Tuglu didn't really know from a, a, a higher education perspective. But being at Tougaloo gave me a safe harbor for four years 
so I could define what kind of black was I going to be. And so there are more people like me than people think. People who have been severed from the richness that a, that being uh, wrapped up in a black community can can transfer to you when you're when you're kind of wrapped around and pro protected. Um, because they don't go to a black church where they're in a healthy place. They don't have black neighborhoods that they grow up in where they see doctors and teachers and lawyers in positions of authority. They've been integrated into society and they're in these little tiny enclaves. My parents did a tremendous job of bringing books into the home and bringing us back around the family and giving us all kinds of experiences that they could. They particularly kept us in a black church because they were trying to make sure we would have some semblance of that black community. But I needed to be dumped into it. And so I picked one of the blackest schools and one of the blackest states I could find. And I went there and I said, you got to figure this out, Marta. You got to figure out how to be around your people. Yes, we still need HBCUs. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you know, one of, one of our traditions pre-COVID uh, was that Sandra and I would pick a uh, uh, an HBCU school to go to for homecoming every year. Mm -hmm. uh, and we would, we would go around the country to different, and, 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 you know, the homecoming at a black campus is just something. Nothing else. like it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, you, you know, it, it, I mean, it, it, but Sandra had never been to one. And my sister went to Tuskegee. My mm -hmm. parents went to Savannah State. Mm -hmm. And and uh, so I had some experience around, around uh, uh, black colleges, but uh, my, my wife had never been to a black college homecoming and, and, and she was just fascinated by it. But, but the thing is, is, is that, and I have friends uh, who, who went to HBCUs and you, you know, the pride that they have, you know, uh, you know, I went to Howard, I went to Southern, you know, I never tell anybody I went to KU or I went to, you know, cause that, I mean, I, I have nothing in my house that's, that's got a Jayhawk on it, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and I just, I just, you know, I was there, uh, we had a strong black student group there. I'm, I'm, I'm close, very close now. Matter of fact, I was on a on a on a meeting this morning, a Zoom meeting, because this is the 50th anniversary of the uh, Black Studies Department at KU. And and uh, but but I just have no no I just do not identify with that school uh, mm -hmm. at all. And and, uh, uh, and 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 that's what I I really miss about uh, not going to an HBCU because because you know folks are just proud of their alma mater, you know, and and uh, and it's, it's just an experience that that I didn't get, so that's that's why I asked you that, and mm -hmm. and uh, and I and I see now uh, that, that I know a lot of families whose whose uh, children are choosing HBCUs again. So, because a lot of us, we're I I think I I've had this conversation with my mother in this way. I said, "You are a child of the civil rights movement. I'm a child of the generation after they turned the cameras off." Mm -hmm. So we were the ones who had to live in this new post-racial America, per se, where everything was supposed to be equitable just because we were now going to the same schools with people. But I had to deal with the kind of ignorance of being in a school and them deciding they were going to play roots for everybody. And then I got to deal with the white kids who come out of the thing crying, slobbing, wanting to hug me, talking about, I'm so sorry for what we did to you. You're a kid. How are you supposed to process that crap? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I understand the intent uh, behind it now as an adult, but that was a vicious thing to do to, to you know, middle schoolers without having any kind of counseling set up and whatnot. Now, my family, we've watched Roots, but I mean, we've always taught the history. It wasn't a it wasn't an awakening for us. Um, I mean, I've read the book, but that I then had to do the emotional labor for white people who were like, oh, I didn't know. That has always been an issue I have about the way that people will implement some of these educational mm -hmm. policies. You mm -hmm. need to think about the impacts that you're putting on the minority group by trying to somehow help white people learn how to be better allies. And I'm tired of it. it. I mean, and I am very honest in the meetings now. People will ask, "Oh, we'd love you to serve on this diversity commission." Mm -mm. What's your What's your strategic plan? Because I'm not going to be the black that you have on there, so you can have visible diversity on mm -hmm. on, on your panel. That's mm -hmm. not where it needs to be. Well, I didn't grow up around anybody who was being racist or whatever it is. I was like, "Where did you Where did you grow up?" <laughs> 
such and such Arkansas? Really? How many blacks were in your community? Well, I mean, we had a couple. Okay. But have you gone and done any reading? Have you gone and sat with someone and accepted your ignorance and asked someone to help you address your ignorance, but have you done your homework first? Don't expect me to do the work for you. And maybe a little bit of that got put in me when I was in Tougaloo too, because I was like, it ain't my job to teach you your history that you didn't learn. I know my history. Mm -hmm. I know your history too, because that's what keeps me alive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So go go study. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I do firmly believe we still have a, a place for them. Now, as many of them, no. can they continue to function um, in the way that they're functioning right now? All of them? Absolutely not. I just had a conversation with another uh, two blue colleague today, and I said, some of our HBCUs got to stop operating like they're JV and we got to go varsity. I'm tired of y'all not putting the right trustee board members in place. Mm -hmm. They got to be. If you're going to be on the trustee board member, I'm going to get in trouble for this. This is going to be good. If you're going to decide to accept a trustee role on, on the board of trustees of an HBCU and it's a private HBCU, including mine, you need to be able to be responsible for raising $500,000 a year while you are serving as a trustee board uh, member. That doesn't mean it has to be all your money, but you have got to bring that kind of money in if you want to be a trustee. You know why I know that? Because that's how the white private schools do it. That's mm -hmm. how they build their endowments. This mm -hmm. is not come and serve on a committee at church and people get mad at me for saying that. That's fine. But this is an institution that's got real bills that's responsible for making sure that we educate our future well enough that they can punch as heavyweights. Mm -hmm. This is not a game. And the schools that keep on doing the status quo, they going to get shut. The mm -hmm. ones who, who graduate to varsity, that's who I want to be with. Mm -hmm. And I'll help you could figure out how to raise the money, but we don't have time to play anymore. <laughs> you you don't got my passion. You ain't got my blood up. We don't have time <laughs> to play with this anymore. And the second I think somebody's playing, I'm like, I ain't got no time for this. <laughs> So I guess that's the way I might answer that question. Uh, you have another follow up for me, or or, or have I? No, 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 that that was it. That, and I really appreciate your your perspective on that. I really do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah, But I, I'm part of black organizations. I'm I I'm a lot less integrationist now than I was maybe when you and I have had some of these other uh, 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 conversations in the past. Um, I really do believe that black folks have got to be willing to work and support one another far more than we have been comfortable with um, in the last couple of decades. We have a responsibility. We cannot wait for other people to take care of the issues that our community is dealing with. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I told you I was excited about this one. You got me, you got me all super, super hyped. Now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's good to connect with, with, with you again. And, and uh, uh, you know, I don't know when we'll have a chance to to, to visit again. Uh, I, I really, really want to go home uh, to Georgia because, you know, I got family there and, and you know, my mom, my mom has two remaining siblings and, mm -hmm. and of course my mom is in Savannah and I talk to her, I talk to both of them regularly, but every time I go home, I, I, I try to make sure I go to Savannah and I got, you know, my whole Savannah family there because I try to see everybody. Um, but, um, uh, I, and I, you know, I, and I think that, that maybe I'll get back to travel again here pretty soon. Absolutely. Things are getting a little better, but I, I'm still a little nervous, but things are getting a little better. But, but uh, you know, you, you've uh, always been one of my, my, my more intriguing kinfolk. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because we're fascinated by people. Uh, yeah. I will tell you, I got my uh, first COVID shot. I'm going to have my second one on May 1st. So whenever you are comfortable after I get inoculated, I am happy to go ahead and make the uh, trip up to Kansas City so we can sit down and, and, and share some good food at a black restaurant. Yeah. I, think, I think COVID is what stopped the last time. We were doing that. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I literally was getting ready to uh, head up to Kansas City. And that's when the, uh, the city uh, declared a state of emergency. And I was like, I'm not going to put you in that kind of yeah. Um, uh, Jeopardy in that kind of way, but I mean, Kansas City is a six-hour drive for me. So you know, as, as, as soon as I'm I'm fully vaccinated and you say it's okay, I'm headed up. All right, we'll look forward to it. 
All right. Thank you. All right. My love to Cousin Sandy. So, okay. All right. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Showing Our Sass Season 2. We appreciate everyone who's been with us along this route. If you're new, you know what to do. Go ahead and like, subscribe, share, comment, all the good things. And I just want you to know we appreciate you so much and look forward to bringing you even more things. We'll see you next week. Thank you.